And welcome back to New Jersey Viewpoint. I'm Ken Rosado. Ischemic strokes are the leading cause of disability in the United States. Time to treat is critical, and of critical importance, I should say, for avoiding irreversible brain damage. Now, a recent study by researchers in the Atlantic Health System shows that patients evaluated in the ambulance during transit could be treated 13 minutes faster once they're in the ER. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Halpern, who's the Chair of Neurosciences Department at Overlook Medical Center, and David Peterson, who's the cl Clinical Manager of Atlantic Ambulance. Good to have you both with us today. Thank you so much for having us. Good to be here. Well, in, knowing a little, just a little bit about stroke, in my family, my mother's had one, my aunt's had one, and my partner, Lori, uh, Lori Stokes' mother had one, uh, so we're sadly familiar with it. Fortunately, in all our cases, uh, uh, they all turned out okay, but because they all got treated rather quickly. Uh, so when I heard about this, it was a, a topic near and dear to my heart. So tell me first off, or explain to the audience, what happens during stroke? So the, the most common cause of stroke is a blocked artery, what's called an ischemic stroke. Uh, that represents 80% of strokes. A clot comes from somewhere, blocks off an artery, and deprives part of the brain of its blood supply. When I was in, the medic in medical school in the last century, they told us you had two or three minutes to reestablish blood flow or that part of the brain was dead. We know now that that's not true, and it's a process that goes over several hours. So we now have a number of methods of interfering, dissolving that clot, reestablishing blood flow, saving brain, and really reversing the effects of the stroke. But as you correctly said, time is absolutely critical in doing that. Now, there are the two different types of stroke. We were talking prior to this, there's ischemic and hemorrhagic, correct? correct. Des describe what those two are. So 20% of strokes are due to bleeding in the brain. 80% uh, are due to lack of blood flow to the brain. When a patient presents to us clinically, we can't know which of those two it is. So one of the first steps we do is a CAT scan of the brain to see if there's been bleeding. If there is bleeding, the interventions that are available to us don't apply and, in fact, would be very dangerous. So the early imaging is critical. Right. So you, if you were to give a <coughs> clot buster drug to somebody who was bleeding, you could, in essence, kill them. Absolutely. So now in comes the ambulance. So uh, the, the idea here is in the past you would or, or traditionally you would rush the person to the ER and in that transport time 5 10 15 however many minutes there's very little you could do just keep them comfortable get them to the ER and let the neurologist in the ER try to figure out what kind of stroke this was but now you're trying to speed up the process of helping them figure out the kind of stroke it is yeah so there's you know some basic interventions that our paramedics can do like starting an IV line checking their blood sugar those simple things but there's also some some time that's lost during transit. So what we're looking to do is use that time to give the neurologist an opportunity to begin the same assessment they'd be doing in the emergency department. Um, so we have a device that's basically mounted over the patient's feet at the stretcher, has a high quality camera, microphone, etc. Uh, and our paramedics will communicate directly to the same neurologist that's going to be treating that patient when they get to the emergency department. And they can begin the exam while they're in transit to the hospital they're going to. So describe what happens during that time. Describe the kind of exam and, and what, the, what kind of things a neurologist can do with this camera, et cetera, that kind of exam. Right, so uh, our paramedics are, are very well trained in identifying patients that potentially are having a stroke. So as soon as they recognize that, um, they'll set that equipment up. So as soon as the patient gets into the ambulance, they're ready to use it. So if we were taking a patient from the field to Overlook Medical Center, for example, uh, we would uh, call in, the neurologist would appear on the screen and be able to immediately start interacting. Uh, our par paramedics will give them a brief report of you know, what they've found so far, what their assessment is, and they'll pick up right from there and go into their more detailed exam. Um, they could do a full NIH stroke scale, which is uh, one of the assessments they do in the hospital setting if they need to, and begin to uh, assess that patient the same way they wouldn't if they were there in person in the ED. So they ask the, the questions like, do you know the day, do you know your name, et cetera? And then so, so when you're dealing with a patient like this, there's a very standardized assessment we do to assess if this is a stroke, what area is damaged, how severe it is. Based on what we know about severity of stroke and type, that then guides the treatment. What we're able to do with this is start that assessment mm -hmm. so much sooner. This all began with several places around the world actually putting a CAT scanner in the ambulance so they could answer that question up front. 
we actually started on the path of doing that, but decided first to test whether we could really assess the patient by telemedicine because Overlook has a big network of telemedicine supported emergency rooms. So we started putting that tool in the ambulance, collaborating with uh, Dave's people uh, who were incredibly supportive of it, and really by serendipity found that we were shaving 13 minutes off assessment time. That's amazing. And you really, you're talking about the potential of brain damage and non-brain da brain damage by doing this. And, and how much? I mean, what, what we know is every minute that passes is two million brain cells gone forever. And so 13 minutes times two million. That is brilliant. Uh, uh, what about the, I mean, is it wiser to always call an ambulance or should people have a relative rush them to the hospital in a car? What's a smarter thing to do? The rule of thumb, call 911, get, you, get an ambulance to take you in. If you're next door to the hospital and you can run, right. go ahead. <laughs> but anything that's going to take more than five minutes to get there under your own power, by all means, call an ambulance. If for no other reason the emergency room is pre-notified and everything is starting to go into place. Now, you were talking about two million cells, uh, you said two million cells a minute? Yeah. Die? Uh, and there's nothing that can regenerate brain cells? Uh, not really. All right, so that's, that's that. It all depends on what, what part of the brain is impacted, so. So that, that impacts what function you lose from that, but as you said, it's the leading cause of disability. And so. what are the signs of stroke people should look for? So, getting back to what you used at the beginning, we use the acronym FAST. So if you see a facial asymmetry drooping on one side of the face, if there's a problem with speech, if you see the arm uh, is, is weak, uh, those are all critical signs that should make you suspicious. Suspicious. The T stands for time, which reinforces the fast, which means get your butt into the emergency room as fast as possible. The two biggest challenges we face are, number one, people who may be having a stroke are in denial and say, I'll go to sleep and it'll be better when I get up, and that's not true. And the other is the transportation time into the hospital so we can do the things that we can do. So the key is, if you have the tiniest bit of a doubt, call 911. Don't worry about being embarrassed. Better to be embarrassed than to have a stroke. Absolutely. And, and uh, typically, of the calls you folks get, how many, wh what percentage would you say are strokes? It's actually a fairly low percentage. It's, uh, of the total calls that we respond to, it's only a percentage or two of uh, the types of emergencies that we're dealing with. Uh, but uh, just like you know, other critical issues like a heart attack, uh, while they may not occur frequently, when they do occur, the potential for us to have a positive impact is also great and the the biggest opportunity that we see here is just that communication uh, that saves that time so you know, it's not just Dr. Halperin and his uh, neurologist he works with but the whole team in the emergency department from the CT tech to the registrars to the ED nurses and physicians uh, that are, are there ready literally ready and waiting at the door when we arrive when we use this technology to alert them and communicate with the neurologist in advance it's brilliant that you've, you've been able to shave this much time and save this much brain in the process thank you so much for being here dr halpern and david peterson all the best to you and all the best to your patients thank good you. to have you thank here you today. very much and for information on all the organizations featured on viewpoint and if you happen to have missed any part of the show and want to see it at your leisure do visit us at abc7ny.com viewpoint We'll be right back with some important information on medical malpractice. Don't go away.